Hello and welcome to this virtual tour of the City of London Police Museum. Whilst the museum is closed due to the COVID-19 situation, we decided to record a series of short videos that will take you around the museum. Um, and today we're going to be looking at early policing. So in fact, the policing before the City of London Police were actually established. Joining me is Martin Murtagh, who is a volunteer at the museum and also a tour guide around London. Hello, Martin. Hi, how are you doing? Good stuff. Right, so let's crack on. Um, founded in 1839, 10 years, in fact, 10 years after the Metropolitan Police was formed, the City of London Police uh, were, were, were established, a complete separate entity to the Metropolitan Police. And they were really responsible for policing the square mile, the, the City of London. But let's go right back before that date, 1839. Shall we go back to, let's say, the medieval period? Um, so, Martin, yeah, what was the medieval City of London policing like? So, yeah, absolutely. So the medieval City of London, I mean, first of all, it was a fortified town um, on the north bank of the Thames uh, with a Roman wall uh, protecting it on three sides. And you can still see remnants of that Roman wall today. Um, at night, uh, curfew will be run and there'll be at least 200 constables um, who would arm themselves with swords and longbows to guard the city until daybreak. But by the mid 16th century, this was all going to change. Um, the city was divided into different areas of what we know as wards. So there are different sections of the city of London, the square mile. And on each ward, we would have a watchman. Now, basically, each male, each man in a, who lived in a ward would be required to be a watchman for at least a year. And they weren't paid, they were badly trained, but their role was to watch out for crime within the City of London. Um, as I said, you know, these were the early policemen um, and it was overseen by the aldermen in the City of London to ensure that each male resident undertook this role. And this would have lasted until the 19th century, and it was known as the watch and ward system. Yeah, um, and in fact, going bits into the, you mentioned the 16th century, uh, one of my favourite people from history, Shakespeare, in his play, he, he mentions the watch, doesn't he? He talks about the watch. Absolutely. So in his play, um, Much Ado About Nothing, which is set in uh, Sicily, uh, Shakespeare actually has a character in there, Dogbury. And Dogbury is the chief of the city police in Messina uh, in Sicily. Now, he's, um, how can I put it, he's a character. Um, he instructs his watchmen um, that actually he tells them that it's acceptable to sleep on duty. And actually, um, if you do see a villain or a thief, um, don't apprehend him, don't touch him, because you may actually become tainted or tarnished by association with this crime. So Shakespeare has this character that, you know, similar to the watchman that was ridiculed um, in the 16th century in the city of London, you know, he just had these guys that um, are going to be ridiculed because they're not really policing Sicily. Yeah, well, it, and it's also worth saying um, it was based in Sicily, as you say, in Italy. But um, I always say this, uh, Shakespeare was writing for a, an audience who are the population of the city of London and around it. So any of these sort of cultural references, lifestyle references, it's all is it's all for the audience, that audience. So it's what they know. So in many ways, I always say this in many ways, what Shakespeare writes about may be based in Italy, uh, but actually it's the point of reference, it does sort of reflect the city of London and, and the people that live there. So maybe this reflects not reality, but maybe reflects um, a public perception of the watch in the late 16th century and going into the uh, 17th century of, of the watch. Um, but moving on to, let's, let's head on into the 17th century. Um, an act was passed mid 1600s, is that right? That's correct. So in 1663, to be precise, um, an act was passed to ensure that at least a thousand men will be on duty each night. Now, this is uh, in the reign of uh, King Charles II. So these uh, men would become known as Charlies. Again, um, a, an early police force. Um, 
they were very badly paid, uh, they were old, they were frail. Um, they'd be equipped with a lantern, uh, a wooden stick, and they were generally really ridiculed by the general public. Um, you know, here we see some of the early weapons that they would have actually used. We have the sword, um, and we can see the rattle there. Now, the rattle, that was actually um, had a dual purpose. So it was actually used as a communication tool, um, whereby, you know, um, the Charlies, uh, who will be on their beats within their ward, could communicate with an adjacent ward by using that rattle. But it was also used as a weapon as well. Now, moving on from the um, 17th century into the 18th century, another act was passed, and we then have uh, the Court of Aldermen in the City of London appointing at least two marshals and six marshalmen who would um, oversee the watchmen making sure that they were doing their duties on a daily basis. They would be armed with swords um, and they would patrol the streets to ensure, as I say, the watchmen were keeping the peace and checking that those streets had no beggars. Now, here we see um, a, an early uh, police uniform and we also see the top hat. So this is in the latter 18th century that a City of London day police were formed, beginning uh, what is really the, pleasant, the, the present police force. The top hat would have city police painted on it, and that is the equivalent of the helmet. It's not very protective. Um, it would blow off in the wind, um, and it would, uh, you know, the policeman ran, then basically it also fall off. So it wasn't ideally the perfect um, piece of protective equipment, and was subsequently replaced. The police in this time, um, they were issued with a blue coat um, every four years, which would have been quite a heavy garment and um, a pair of boots every two years. Now, moving on into the early 19th century, uh, Robert Peel, the then, the then Home Secretary, he presents a Metropolitan Police Bill to Parliament. His idea is to have a formal police force in London and in the home counties. Um, but the city did not want to lose its independence or its power, and it really did not want to be part of this police force. Um, so they were allowed not to become part of the Metropolitan Police. They were allowed to continue policing in their own way. And in the um, mid 19th century, in the city of London, a day police and a nightly watch of at least 500 men was formed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, again, it, it, it's, we've got this conflicting view, haven't we? I mean, we've got this, this display of some equipment from the museum that would have been used. Incidentally, that lantern in that middle picture at the bottom, that's late 19th century. So everybody ignore that. That's not part of this story for the moment. But there we have that top hat, the tunic. You know, there is a is a is a truncheon, uh, some examples of early handcuffs. Um, but the, for the watch, though, the usual look of the watch um, was we've got a photograph. Whereas there we go. There's a watchman, a uh, wide brimmed hat, a lantern, a stick. And you mentioned Robert Peel because we've, we've got this fantastic cartoon in the museum. Uh, this is part of um, the City of London's collection, uh, as was that image of the Shakespeare book. So we've got a lot of resources for us. And this is a, is a cartoon by Robert Heath and it's dated 1829. And it's called a slap at the Charlies. So that's, the, that's them. There they are, the Charlies. You can see their rattles that Martin was talking about, the hats sticks there's a lantern on the floor it's been crumpled and there's a young dapper gentleman smacking someone in the face though on the nose that is robert peel and behind him is the duke of wellington he's actually i don't know if you can see it, it says go to it bob uh and it's, it's obviously sweeping out the old the old from the new you know you've got these um old uh men who aren't paying attention to their job they're sleeping at night time this is the image if we just go back to that image can we go back i'll just say you know so look at that photograph again there he is he's old he's not exactly the man who's gonna run after criminals down the road as he jump over the walls and so on um so there is this public perception of the watch looking like this but what you've just described martin um is very much quite organized isn't it and something else we have in the museum on display is this watch book and it's from the tower ward watch house and it records a lot of details uh here's a photograph of it in the case on display uh martin have you got do you want to say anything about it 
So absolutely. So there is this conflict that, you know, the the Charlies, the Watchmen, they were ridiculed, they were old, um, they weren't effective. Um, and you just saw in that cartoon how, you know, Robert Peel is, um, well, you can see, you know, what he's doing to them there. But we have, is say, this conflict that we have the Watchbook and this actually shows there was some form of organised policing because of what Watchbook itself, it details um, the watchmen who are going to be on duty, uh, what time they will be on duty, um, it details their names and, um, you know, it provides evidence that actually there was some sort of organised organized force here. Um, and it also records the incidents and occurrences uh, for each patrol. And I'll just read one here that it said, at half past nine this evening, Cunning the inspector came to the watch house and said the parts of the hoardings in front of the Richie Lee yard in Thomas Street had begun to fall down, with timber laying down in the streets. I informed Mr Mortimer that the timber should be brought to the warehouse, 13 planks, 14 broken pieces of timber. Now, this is a, <laughs> it's an observation as we called it in the book. And, you know, somebody has gone to the watch house to uh, inform about this uh, hoarding which has fallen and the consequences of that. And the watchman is then advising um, Mr Mortimer what he should do next. So, you know, this is a, as I say, an observation that's been recorded in the watch book. So it does show that there was some sort of organised police force in the early days. Yeah, and a bit of responsibility as well. So people are taking responsibility. The watch are taking it seriously. So is it in the middle of the night? It was um, half past nine this evening. Yeah, there we go. Half past nine yeah, this evening. Half past nine. So early evening, early night rather. Um, so yeah, there's, there's there's a responsible attitude, and something's happening. They're not just thinking. They're just sitting back, drinking their whatever, their tea, and going, "Ah, oh, whatever." You know, off you go. <laughs> um, I've got another quote from that same page. Actually, this is the page you got open, isn't it? It's uh, the 25th of June, 1833. And this one's a bit more dramatic, actually. It's, say, it's, saying, it's interesting, it's a busy night, because again, at half past nine this evening, same sort of time, uh, I was called to the Bell Public House, Tower Place. There, founds the, um, it says unreadable here, founds the, someone who appeared to be abusing Mrs. Tulipson. I re recommended Mrs. T to give him his wages. So obviously he was an employee abusing Mrs. Tulipson uh, to give him his wages and to go about her business. She said she would not pay him, but she might go on coming by a quarter of half an hour. I informed uh, of the people at the door. The servant said Mrs. Tulipson had starved him and just had him thrown into the street. Uh, so there's a bit of trouble going on. Someone become abusive in a pub, maybe a bit of drunkenness and the, the watchman there advising people what to do, not arresting anyone as such, but uh, it's trying to be the mediator, sorting out the problems and the issues and listening to other people as well. So the people in the street and on the door and so on. So again, it sort of reflects a bit of responsibility and quite often like this is uh, you have evidence like what we've just said on the one hand and then evidence of cartoons by William Heath on the other hand and perhaps the reality lies somewhere in the middle um, but I like to think that perhaps we can bring the reality a bit towards this watch book because I think it really does show some uh, responsibility and organisation and recording as well of what happened uh, in the city of London in the watch before the actual police. So uh, Martin yeah should we, should we move on to uh, what finally happened? Okay, so we mentioned Robert Pill um, and the Metropolitan Police Bill um, that was actually passed. So Robert got his wishes where he set up the Metropolitan Police. Um, and this strengthened the hands of those in the city um, that wanted to recognise a, a formal or more formal um, police force. Um, in 1832, the London Police was officially formed in the city, so it was the London City Police, and it became the City of London Police with the passing of the City of London Police Act in 1839. And this gave uh, statutory approval um, to the force as an independent police body um, and headed off attempts uh, to merge with the Metropolitan Police. So in 1839, 
the City of London Police Force is formally recognised. Now, just moving on, in 1861, um, there was a recruitment drive and it attracted men who were low in height, they were old in years, they were weak with little character, and um, the city were concerned that it was going to be going back, you know, to badly trained elderly, elderly gentlemen as part of this police force. So the applicants had to be under 40 years of age. Um, they should be at least five foot nine um, in height without shoes and the ability to read. Now, the wages were poor. The conditions meant um, that the average length of length service was something like four years. But this would improve um, with uh, almost like social responsibility and uh, health care and housing, that it would actually improve the police force and um, the length of service. Now, the Course Common Council um, in the City of London, they created a commissioner role and a police committee. And the committee and the commissioner would oversee the policing of the square mile and have responsibility for running uh, the City of London Police Force and they are still in charge of running the force today. So we still have a police commissioner and a police committee in the City of London that are responsible for running the City of London Police today. Brilliant. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, we, we are going to finish up here. I said it's a short tour. Um, we're going to be producing more of these that will go around the museum looking at the different aspects of the history of the City of London Police. Uh, if you want to contact us, our details are there. There's an email, Twitter, Facebook and also look us up on the internet too on the website. Um, so that leads me to say thank you very much for joining us. Uh, keep an eye out for more videos to come and Martin, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you.